there. It's, it's an international boring competition. <laughs> it was originally going to be in Augusta, but the city fathers slept through the offer. And <laughs> we open tonight with the social calendar. Children believe in goblins, adults believe in demons, the sophisticated believe in knowledge, and the earth believes that eventually its date will arrive. Mm -hmm. The dance awaits. To himself, though unknown since he was not listening, many a man has said, if I can but stay as operationally able, partially comatose as I am now for another 40 or 50 years, it'll not matter anyhow. <laughs> Thus, it is not true that none of man's prayers can be answered. <laughs> As regards a certain matter, one man says that now only one thing causes him any mental shame. Catching himself thinking about anything that anybody else thinks about. Man is the only creature who has a certain function that is not only useful as all functions naturally are, but one whose operations are quite often also irrelevant, even though it continues to run as though otherwise. While everyone's aware of the function, they are not of this peculiarity, in that all the knowledge they normally have of it comes from its monitoring, monitoring of itself. There was once a race of creatures who, in their efforts to go from point A to point B, were hindered by the fact that their only means of transportation was point A, <laughs> whose, nat whose native attitude was either that there was no way to point B, or if there was, you couldn't get there from where they were. <laughs> and at least semi-interesting conundrum, wouldn't you say? The window panes in the trains the human mind rides have, have as a property the ability to reflect back to men's eyes scenes outside which do not actually exist out there. The unrealized folly and futility of the intellect lies in men holding up mirrors in front of mirrors and expecting to learn therefrom more than is physically possible. To recognize shadow from substance, that is the ability of the more conscious. Auto audio joys. One man had a radio in his car, which he came to believe would not run properly without said receiver being on. This conclusion prompted by the fact that it was always on. The only view available to the ordinary is a personal view. Sad, but true. <laughs> According to one legend, man has no afterlife of reward or punishment as generally imagined, but rather live through such before coming into this life. <laughs> Deep consideration of this matter may reveal to you the lack of, its, of the, this particular legend's popularity. A viewer writes, It's been several weeks or more since you last said that, until a person realizes that life itself is alive, nothing makes sense. And I miss it. Would you please say it again, Sam, just for me? <laughs> Okay, but don't call me Sam. <laughs> even though lions, even though lungs and air are two separate entities, until you see that the former do not operationally exist without the latter, you will never be satisfied with the sight of a similar situation but between routine consciousness and its total dependency on thought. There was once a planet not far from our galaxy, which was completely taken over by the Anti-Totally Society. Probably a lesson in there for us all. 
An elder mystic told a young apprentice, if you ever get the urge to start a new religion or a mystical activity and want it to be popular, the main thing is to be vague, very vague, which will not be a problem since if you have the urge to start such an activity, you'll still be pretty much in the dark about what this is all about anyway. <laughs> then, the thing you've got to watch out for is if later you begin to wake up to reality yourself, and thus understand what this has actually always been about, you can't suddenly then start telling people what you know. No. You've got to remain vague. Never forget, my boy. Stay vague if you want to succeed. And to think that there are still those who imagine the mystical to be devoid of humor. Ha, ha. There was once a planet of machines, and one particular type had the unique ability to run at the normal level, like all the others, or operate in a way that intensified its operations. But as with all mechanical devices, it was difficult for them to comprehend anything about themselves and thus make use of this additional unprogrammed possibility. A correspondent writes, I believe I know where men get off track regarding thought. As children begin to speak and try to express ideas, adults, in an attempt to reinforce their connection to the physical world, will, for instance, pick up a spoon and move it toward the child while saying, spoon, spoon, and thus, from the outset, does the distinction between thought and action become blurred and confused. That one, my friends and news lovers, almost did not make the cult. Cut. <laughs> it has too much of a signing bonus. <laughs> On one world once lived a race of creatures who were each born wearing glasses. But the lenses in them were angled at such a degree that no matter where the creatures looked, they always in part caught glimpses of themselves. One man's motto was, I don't mind being lame as long as I don't have to live around runners. <laughs> and of course the great thing about being human is that you can imagine that you live anywhere you like. Perhaps another Perhaps another, perhaps another distinction of those who know the truth about life being that they give not a fig where they reside internally. Maybe, perhaps. If to those living at ground zero, all news is bad news, then how much different can the news be to the few not so residing? How different? How different? Well, this different. They have no news. They must provide their own. They must become their own. As regards the planet's notable rancidity, all already thought, writ, or said is now spoiled. The wondrous steed sought by the mystical knights can only be captured by those who forever stay days ahead of where it will be next. On the planet Dura, the wise men taught that the shame is not in being born on Dura, but in remaining there. A teaching whose degree of success, I assume you instantly realize, was in direct proportion to a decrease in the planet's population. There was once a man who mused, thank God for the ordinary, especially the ordinary within me, or else I would have nothing against which to struggle and strengthen myself. He said this with a straight face, 
and in a sincere tone of voice, in spite of the fact that he was being forced to do so. <laughs> there periodically appears a man here and there who can say the same as he above, and yet not mean it quite as insincerely as the former. <laughs> At some time, everybody can use some help physically. At no times does even apparent mental assistance help. <laughs> this is another one of those private test ideas whereby if it seems to you insane, it proves one thing about you. And if you understand it, something else. <laughs> what bothered one man more than anything else in life was the looking back at the end of each day and realizing how seldom he had been at home. There was once an animal that had the unusual ability of being able to imagine. It could imagine anything except itself being free. For you see, it never realized that it was imprisoned in the first place. A man once thought, it's probably for the best that men don't fully realize their situation. Of course, this is just what I think. And we all know how what you think will lie to you. And a viewer suggests, it's probably for the best that men don't actually think the kinds of things you make up that they do in your little stories. <laughs> yeah, probably. One man had a brain that was half active and half catatonic. And sometimes he thought he was normal and sometimes he thought not according to which side of his brain was in charge at the time. <laughs> in a solar system not far from here was once a world which was taken over entirely by the we don't want to think about stuff like that federation. Probably a lesson therein already known to all or at least those partially alert. A man once mused, if we could get men to take the injunction against incest as strongly regarding mental activity as they do regarding physical, me suspects the intellectual landscape would change dramatically. And there was once a planet on which it was not necessary to periodically kill all the artists. This problem was automatically taken care of by the fact that one day constantly followed another. <laughs> Where predictability reigns, there will be no mystics found. The futility of censuring men's normal state of consciousness is not comparable to beating a dead horse, but rather of flogging a steed that was stillborn to begin with. After a one certain thing is said, there's little left to profitably be so. There was once a man who waited for a certain special ship to come in. He stood on the beach and looked out to sea until his eyes became fixed thereon. And this condition, as right as it seemed to be, as right as it seemed to one looking for something, in fact resulted in a deadly decrease in his ability to see. A sailor's lament. Oh, the ocean giveth and the ocean taketh away, but what it primarily does is mesmerize with its incessant waves. Up, no, back and forth, up and down, to and fro. Oh, and here's the latest scores. It's still nothing to nothing in favor of you know who. Now back to the news. Only thought can spit into the wind and then complain about the outcome. <laughs> Not men, as is commonly held. One sign of routine awareness is the inability to correctly place the blame. The sure sign thereof being the inclination to assign any. 
Lions never stumble, not because of some special physical grace, but due to lack of thought. You might note that when they asked Socrates to kill himself, they didn't ask him to swallow poison, but rather his ideas. And now for a short reading from that book, The Vicidity of Human Experience, of Human Existence. There was once a group who referred to the enlightened as those who've become unglued. <laughs> and based on this term's present use and connotation, I guess it's understandable why it has not come back in favor. But since it's just us, unglued, unglued, unglued. <laughs> now there, don't we all feel better? <laughs> since we all know what it's really talking about. <laughs> As regards certain matters, privacy and secrecy can be a bonus. In fact, a minimally required bonus. There was once a land in which the king was forced to ban all public displays of hypnotism as a form of entertainment when it was realized that those being hypnotized were routinely merging with the hypnotist. <laughs> if men could see the genetic web holding together the universe, same as fish recognize water, their perceptions of human relationships would be shaken at their very foundations. And I might add, the possibility of a freedom heretofore unsuspected opened up. The science of sound relative to source and dispersion. Putting a speaker in front of a microphone will either result in feedback, or if we're actually talking about something else here, ordinary thought. <laughs> there was once a boy who had a pet. At least in the beginning he thought that he had the pet. <laughs> Though he came to eventually revise his view of the relationship. <laughs> One of the more salient, though unnoted, characteristics of routine consciousness is its ability to see more to something than is there when necessary to maintain itself, and its likewise talent to see of seeing less than is present when need be. Thus does the ordinary mind deal in words, metaphors, and symbols, while the neural activity of the few resembles an electrical storm op over a freshly swept clean plain. How sweet smells the air when gone from a place that never truly was. And lastly, this item, one man's latest pondering. Well, if no one knows anything, then the only ones who do are those who know this. He also says he finds this kind of cute. Be right with you. Uh, if you recall, we had been talking about the fact that if you cannot, in a non-physical manner, separate yourself from life, non-physical, which I understand makes almost no sense to ordinary people, and what the hell does it mean? 
you can either you either have some notion of what it means or you don't. But until you can do that in a way that is discernibly successful to you, then there's really nothing else possible because you are left in a piece of living machinery, not meant literally, but in a piece of living machinery, this reality, this universe, wherein your connection, non-physically, is through the only operation possible, the mind, your connection to the location in which you exist, this reality, is through thought. And if you do not find a way, if you cannot separate, actually feel and understand when you can do it, a separation, you understand it's possible whether you can do it at constantly or not, it's not the question, but you can feel it and you know the separation and even if I didn't try to equate it with the so-called absolute state of enlightenment, enough of you have had moments or more of it that you understand that it is not just a theoretical something that I've made up a term or I'm describing as being able to separate yourself from life. It is as though while all of the external world, while everything continues to dance its dance, that everything continues to flow with the same rhythm, everything is the action of the external world. It's still the same. But suddenly, for the first time in one's life, the internal, your internal world does not match the activity of the external. That the waves in a man's mind, a sailor up in a, who gets high enough, let us say, up in a crow's nest, that for the first time your, wa your thoughts in the waves of the ocean are not one. Having nothing to do with whether you're in sync with the waves, remember. But that what is going on externally continues to your own uh, tempo but internally, it is as though the observer has finally been able to pull his sight, been able to in some way unpeel his ability to see from that which he thought he was always seeing. Without this ability, without being able to to experience this. You cannot mentally ever understand anything about life. You can play with theories, you can play with ideas, and it's none of my concern, but they never come to any conclusion. They can answer nothing until there is a distinction between your consciousness and what's going on in life you are not from a real view. You are not actually conscious. That's why I continue to use terms like collective consciousness or the collective mind of man because de facto there is no difference between what an ordinary man thinks and the world. And by the world I mean it in the widest possible use of the term. It's not a theory and it's at the heart of all of this and people can either some people either see it or they don't. And you cannot be talked into it or tricked into it. And there's no way I can mentally palaver forever or palaver to such a point that you become overcome with palaver and go, my God, now I see it. And that is that a man can be standing right there talking to you or to anyone, to the world, and be discussing. As the scenario starts out, that apparently he has the credentials, the background, even the physical charisma. There seems to be an, an aura of importance. And he begins to speak on matters, matters considered weighty indeed by the populace, by ordinary people, matters of his neighborhood or his group's political future, the impending ecological catastrophes, the fiscal dangers lurking about. But he starts and you, you begin to listen, and it sounds as though, and you have always taken it to be, and everyone else takes it to be, the head wolf properly howling, giving warnings, speaking of matters of extreme importance. And once you, be, you can do what I'm discussing, 
once you are sufficiently experienced with having this separation take place, that there is life, then in a sense, I always hate to be this dualistically crude and dogmatic, but to make the point, let's assume there is like a, an invisible screen between you and the world out there. That here's you, consciousness, you the observer, you the thinker, and then is everything outside of you. Until you have the experience sufficient of knowing yourself, again, this does not exist and it's not quite so simplistic, but that you can now suddenly feel that your eyes are peeled away from this screen, that you have stepped back, that something has happened, and no longer is what's going on out there the controlling factor of your mind. And not that necessarily what's going on in front of you or what you are, absolute, what you are directly observing is by any means necessarily at any particular moment what you're thinking about. None of this makes, it just sounds like we talk in circles, I know, to an ordinary mind, but until you have it happen, there is no, there's not any better explanation or description of it, so I'll press on, but when you have it happen, suddenly what's going on out there, it does not change. It does not take on supernatural colors, it does not take on some kind of occult glow around it. It does not change because in some way you have now been blessed by the gods and they're going to change reality to suit you. It's the same damn thing that's been going on forever that everybody says they know. Well, yeah, I see it. Hell yeah, I can attack it. I can make fun of it just like you. Until it happens, you have no idea that you don't see what's going on in life. And that's about as foolish as any other statement because that doesn't make any sense. If somebody hears that in ordinary mind and says, well, you can't mean it literally. And I say, well, what if I do? And they go, well, you're crazy. And, they, and I say, well, what if I mean it metaphorically? And then they go, okay. But explain it. And you can't. What does it metaphorically mean if, it didn't, if I don't mean it literally, which I do? <laughs> but they even try to ease off and say, all right, take it metaphorically. And they go, all right, metaphorically, I have never seen life. I've never seen what's actually going on. And they go, okay, that's, that's interesting. I give up. What does it mean? And then I'm sorry I brought it up because I said, okay, it's metaphorical. And then I'm stuck again. Metaphorical for what? It's not metaphorical for anything. It's literal. But so you can't do that. You understand? So it's... Remember that big, that uh, city big game hunter, I'm not sure anybody, but from last time, that decided he was going to buy himself a carousel. But the only problem, it didn't work out because he couldn't ever determine exactly what part of the beast he should aim and shoot. <laughs> until the experience, until you've had sufficient experience of this happening, this makes no sense, I understand. But enough of you have that I can press on. And it is as though you're suddenly aware, in a sense, that there is a distinction. That there is like this screen between you. That there is an actual cutoff point between you and that. Or I can make the metaphors or the symbolism even sim more simplistic. It's as though you have been watching a movie all of your life. And you took it as real life. You took it as what was going on. And then one day... But now to watch it, here's, here's the tricky part. You have been standing as close as you could to this screen. Literally. For this symbolism to make sense, I've got to describe the in, its internal workings on a literal basis. You can figure out what this turns into. This would be like a merry-go-round that decided to bag itself a carousel. But at any rate, you have been watching a movie or a TV this close, literally. And then one day, somebody says, hey, and they grab you forcibly and they pull you back away from the screen. <laughs> it's still what you were looking at, but the relationship, what else can I tell you, uh, has changed considerably. And I'm not going to try to weave any more wondrous metaphors into this. It's that, in a sense, you're seeing the same thing. The movie has not changed, but you have watched it here all of your life. And I assume that you get some notion that if you had that kind of proximity, almost a physical adhesion, or at least a physical proximity to where you're touching, 
Even if I told you it was a movie, which people say such things as that. That's not an old idea of saying, well, all we are is living in an illusion. I mean, you had records of thousands of years ago of people speculating on that or claiming we're living in a world of illusion, we're living in a dream, what we're seeing, what we think we're experiencing in our normal state is just maya. It's just an illusion. It's not actually happening. It's not that simple, or if you like, it's even simpler than that. It's you're right here, and what they're unknowingly pointing at is what I'm trying to get you to consider, or what I'm discussing. It's not that it's an illusion. It's not that it's wrong. There's not really no criticism of it. If you're satisfied with it, so be it. And the majority of humans are wired up to have no possibility other than to be satisfied. That's why this is so infrequently talked about and less so even understood. But there you are and what you're watching, what you've always watched is in no way an illusion. It's not a mistake. It's not a flaw in your consciousness, your awareness, your perception, the intelligence. The only thing that's different and someone more conscious, someone in a different state, someone who knows a bit about the truth about life is it's as though you have been pulled back away from it it's the same movie going on the same activity same action going on and again I'm not going to carry this any further just, just to state it to you it's the same thing going on out there the movie but your relationship to it has now been altered I'm not going to I'm not going to blow any more illusionary colored smoke in that balloon and to say, well, it's fantastic. The, the first thing is, when a person has a moment, the first thing that the Buddhas of the world do when they reach enlightenment is not explanations, exclamations of fantastic scenes and unbelievable otherworldly joy. That's what gets written down and remembered. The first thing that strikes a Buddha when he sees what's going on is it's not extraordinary nature, this part. It's not the man suddenly goes, oh, now I see it. This is not the world I've been watching. It was indeed Maya. It was an illusion. These are evil spirits or these are, these are puppets. These are not people. These are not actual activities. I didn't realize it until my eyes opened up in this mystical way, until I took on this supernatural ability. I now see these are not people. These are not trees. This is not my family. This is not my occupation. It's some kind of, you know, like genies, spirits, goblins. It's, it's supernatural forces behind the scene. No. That sounds like. That's what ordinary people would like to believe or even imagine if there was some kind of thing about some supernatural state of enlightenment. Is pow. My God, how extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But first off, that's not what hits you. What hits you first off when you realize, uh-oh. I'll do it again. The first thing, first few times, or at least the first time, you, after a few seconds, a man normally... I hate to predict what will happen, but my man normally has a sensation of, oh, if this is not being enlightened, I'm not sure I'm up to the real thing. <laughs> or, conversely, if this is not knowing the secret, I'll take this. At any rate, after a few seconds, the first thing that strikes you is not scenes of some extraordinary, wondrous, or grotesque nature. It's the same damn scenes you've been watching all your life. And so the first thing that strikes one of the extraordinariness of the condition is how ordinary the basis of it is that the same things you're in the same life, the same friends, the same activities, the same wind, the same trees, same cars going by, and yet, how's this for you? Inspiring statement. And yet, it's not the same. Ooh, let me write that down. I know. I'm four or five thousand years late with that one. In case you missed it, the, that little aside was that in the state, instead of seeing the cars go by, the people walk by, the clouds move, the wind blow, your stomach rumble, instead of that, now what you see is the cars go by, the people walk by, <laughs> the wind blow, your stomach rumble. Except from a different position. Not floating overhead with astral body projections. <laughs> not being held up by your little you know, ears by God. You're still right there. The street, the whole movie, the activity is just about where it was. But it's as though 
according to what it takes for you to get an allegorical picture. It's as though you step back a couple of feet. For those of you who are better, it's internally. You just moved a millimeter back. All it takes is a slight shift. Trust me. I was going to say a slight shift. Just a slightest shift to change it. But it's just the change that gives a slightest shift. So take it either way you like. It is then, it is the feeling, it is the enlightenment, the liberation of consciousness, the awakening of the mind. Is that the first thing that strikes, I don't mean this is the end of it, but the first thing that strikes, the basic, the minimal, the continuing aspect of it that, for, with which a man becomes familiar and what I've been speaking of of late, for some of you that perhaps could use it, is then what really begins to use a news item tonight is after that happens a few times, as unextraordinary as it may sound in my descriptions, it is a part of the story that I told that one man reached the point that what bothered him most in life was the looking back at the end of each day at how seldom he had actually been at home. Another way of saying that that is a continuing minimum or minimal part is the floor of the experience itself of doing anything extraordinary is to be able to, or for it to happen. Being able to is kind of gross, to put it that way, because it makes everyone feel like, God forbid, feel like, well, you're right, I should be doing better. Uh, if, it should be, if it happens, it is the minimal floor of any understanding, and that is, put it crudely, that internally, the moments come about more often, that you do, in fact, you realize that as though you step back and also inherent in this stepping back or the shift in position is that internally the observer, consciousness, shuts up. It is consciousness without comment. That here it is, you're on the train, if you want it that way, riding along and your face is right against the window. It always has been. It has to be. That's not a mistake. It's not a flaw in man. That is the way consciousness, that is the way the intellect, the high end of the nervous system and the brain gets ignited in man. You cannot start off standing back and looking. You cannot be in some way, I put it to you crude, which I have before, you cannot start out being awake or being enlightened. There is no such thing. That's a real childish hobby for people, uh, which is not unknown, as a, an aside right quick, for people who have believe that themselves involved and would be mystical activities throughout the years is then to get concerned they just decide to have a child or find themselves with their female part being with child and become concerned about well, here's our chance I've devoted years of my life to trying to be a more awake enlightened person and I've surely picked up some knowledge and wisdom so here it is I'll at least give my child a head start that which I never had maybe no one ever had because then a man thinks back, Jesus and Buddha, all the stories, those guys didn't raise children. I will raise a child. I will withhold from it all the things that would disturb, distract, put to sleep, hypnotize, do ill to his little mind and consciousness. I will have enough wisdom to at least avoid some of them. Ah, oh, yes. I assume all of you know, if you live in the same, I started to say neighborhood, the same city as such a person, get away from them. <laughs> that child is going to make Dennis the Menace or Rosemary's Baby <laughs> look like an innocuous little hamster. <laughs> back, to the, back to the real point. That was metaphorical, literal, and symbolic. That little message there. All three in one at the same price. <laughs> you cannot get, no one's intellect gets fired up until, in a sense, you get up against the window pane. To change metaphors back to riding a train, that being life. That you have a little child, or you are a child, and their parents holding the child on their knee, and the child can begin to speak, which is the first signs whether people interpreted that or not, of the intellect firing up. That the child begins to actually speak. It really, you begin to see him focus his eyes, if you don't get technical, but shortly after that, when he begins to focus enough that the adults around go, he's beginning to recognize me, he's beginning to recognize objects. Or if when I walk up, he'll react the same way. He always smiles, or when he sees my husband, you know, his father, whatever. But shortly after that, 
The real proof is, is why it is so astounding to people and such a joyful occasion, <laughs> from one view, <laughs> from the collective view, is the kid begins to speak. And that's what everybody remembers the first day he said mama. When he says mama, what you've got to do, if you'll follow this right quick, there, take my allegory again. There sits a nice ordinary, ordinary people, sane ordinary people, with their little kid sitting there in their lap, and they're sitting there next to the window on the train. They're riding through life. Everything's fine. And the little kid reaches whatever age it is, and he begins to make little sounds. His eyes begin to kind of focus in to where he quits looking like one of those dogs in the rear view of them. And he, oh, I know how cute he is if he's yours, but you know. He looks like a, an attorney at some old folks home that, with, for whom they have withdrawn his medicine, his medication. At any rate, his eyes begin to focus. Not a clergyman, an accountant, taxi driver. <laughs> They're holding the kid there in their lap. But he's not up intellectually. Neurally, he is not up against the window pane. And when he starts focusing his eyes, what he's trying to do, in a sense, is look out the window. You understand? In other words, he is beginning to focus on life. He is beginning to see and to have a sensation that there is something out there going on that is apart from me which is one of the operational definitions of consciousness at the minimal level, is you feel separate from life. Whereas a tree cannot feel separate from life. Even a higher primate, anything lacking the ability to speak, lacking what we refer to as our cortical intellect. No animal feels separate from life. Not in any way, they simply do not. There is no sensation of life being going on out there and that they're watching it at any time, even if they're not doing anything. That's why you can't catch animals staring at us, because if they're not looking for food, they're not actually looking at anything. They're not looking off meditating like the nature of the food chain. <laughs> because they feel no separation. Anyway, part, one description, my description I'm giving, which is a valid one, if you can follow it. The child, all this happens simultaneously. Not one thing causes another, you understand. I'm not talking about cause and effect. I'm just describing to you how it takes place in a way that's not normally considered never seen but the child as he begins to speak and the intellect begins to actually fire up and it becomes an operational a continual operational part of him what happens is simultaneously is then his face gets up against the window pane like everyone else he then has this thing that I'm looking at something there is a world outside of me taking place of which I am now aware of which I am conscious it's like this so there you are it's not this a mistake that's where you start if you cannot get a child let me add this little part if it helps. If you can't get a child face up against there, not just hold it, of course, but if you can't get a child through some way, maybe push him several times and keep coming back. If you can't get a child face up there and get it stuck there, you've got problems. I mean, literally. I'm changing from a metaphor to physical, but you actually, no, actually you have a child with brain damage. You have a child whose wiring system is uh, miswired, really. Because that is a sign of sanity, and that is a sign that you are fairly well normally wired up, and that your intellect has now been ignited, and is not, the pilot light's not going to go out. <laughs> is that you get up, is that your face, you become, you understand, you become stuck, you become addicted. It becomes the only way of life, is you realize this world, in other words, you become conscious in the ordinary sense. The intellect is fired up adequately for you to pass as a human now. But to do that, Simultaneously, as you have now got your face pressed up there, that is the state. So it's, it's not that you made a mistake somewhere along the line, it's your parents or life mistreated you. That's how everyone starts. Zoroaster and everyone started with their face pressed against the window pane. You've got to, or you can't ever get away from it. You'll never understand any of this. At any rate, there is nothing resembling an extraordinary state of consciousness. There's not even an entrance to it until it begins to happen, until the experience I'm discussing becomes sufficient that you realize that you understand, that you're familiar with the state through experience, that it, it is a fair description that you feet, inches, it doesn't matter. And at the same time, it is that the distance changes. Your perspective, your relationship to what's going on out there, not physically changes, is why I say internally, of course, because it's not physically going, oh, wait a minute, let me step back and think about that. It's internally your relationship with what's going on apparently outside the window, on the other side of the screen of consciousness, and that separation between you and the world, the relationship has changed. None of that changes. 
just forget that for the time being. It's just scenes are still going on, scenery is passing by. But internally, you have stepped away and simultaneous with that, it just happens all the time. It's part of it. Is internally, you suddenly shut up. Which with most people, and for a long time, and you can still forget after you're familiar with it, you're not even aware of your running commentary. How I many of you tell people, do you realize you're always thinking, chattering to yourself? Everybody goes, well, sure, big deal. So what? What's the point? You go, well, nothing. <laughs> well, it's not, not being critical. They don't see any possibility. Plus, if you said, do you realize it goes on constantly? Uh, it'd be a f safe wager that a good percentage of ordinary sane people would deny that or want to argue it. And they would even look off like they were considering it. And if you go, it goes on constantly. And they go, well, <laughs> damn, oh, I have, you're probably right, it goes on a lot. And I go, well, nah, how about constantly, <laughs> that it never stops? And they go, and see, part of the trick is, it will momentarily stop. <laughs> but if they go, well, and they go, oh, you know, I, I, I don't see the importance of it, but I, you know, I can't really, I can't tell you that I do it constantly. In fact, uh, well, I never thought about it, and I'm not going to stand here and argue with you, but uh, I don't, I, I don't really agree with that. And all you can do goes, well, okay. It takes, not only the experience, because the experience happens to people. I've mentioned that before. There are all kinds of physical shocks and calamities in an ordinary man's life. People, ordinary people, have the experience of this internal chatter stopping. It is, they do not benefit from it. It is generally so momentary that they take no conscious, they take no notice of it. At times when it does, and it, when it does run into extended periods, and it's not a complete shutting down internally, but a substantial decrease in it, oftentimes uh, severe shock, not just physical shock, it can be so-called emotional shock, uh, the death of one's mother or father, or husband or wife, that kind of thing. There's not unknown and it may not meet the qualifications medically for a shock, but it's that thing that the person not themselves, and everybody around them knows it. There is a kind of, and you can almost see it now that I mentioned it, if you ever have occasion to look at or think back, that you can look at them and it's as though and people describe this, uh, it's like her, her spirit's gone since her husband died. Or his spirit's gone when his mother died. They were so close and, I mean, it's been several weeks. And it's as though somebody just sucked his guts out. His, his soul is gone, his spirit. What they're sensing. They're sensing something physically, but they're also sensing that internally, the chatter, the comment on life has decreased. And they're, they're concerned about it. As ordinary people should be. They sense that this is not good. Because the person just kind of sits. Or if they don't just sit, they can go, let's go out and, you know, it's been two weeks since your mother died. Come on, let's go out and we'll have dinner and talk up old times. So the person goes, okay. And they get there at the restaurant. And, but, and you notice, the, the other person, you notice that this person has been in distress. They'll t you'll talk for a while and he goes, no, 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 he'll eat his food. But you notice, you'll turn around and he's constantly... You know, for periods, and you never think about it until you see it happen. That is, you never think about it, the norm, until you see the abnormal variety of it. That that is, you got two things, a little joke or something, and he listens, he chuckles like you do, and he seems like his old self. And so you, it's like the pause in conversation. You reach the end of a paragraph, and maybe you reach for your bread, and you can't analyze it, but suddenly you look up, and he's looking off. And people do this, ordinary people, but you realize, without a clock, you realize this is out of the ordinary. He's overdoing it. And you say, are you okay? And he goes, oh, oh yeah. And so you start another story. And he, he nods and glances off and you get the punchline and you laugh and he laughs and <laughs> you reach for a glass of water. <laughs> and you look up and again he's kind of there's a difference between that and a kind of intellectual lead a fix when somebody is just internally. If somebody got mad, if it's the same situation, a waiter came up and spilled water in the guy's lap or bought the wrong food and this guy had a bad temper and he can stare off. Somebody can stare off like this, look off, and get unusually quiet and motionless. 
and you're not disturbed <laughs> over the lack of internal comments, you understand, you know that you might get disturbed over, you know that internally they're coming up to the point of an eruption. <laughs> and nobody ever analyzes this. I, mean, I doubt if you'd ever hear it described on this planet. But people know that there's a difference between somebody who can get quiet and stare and almost immobile and look off and you're not concerned that they have ceased an adequate comment on the running nature or running comment on the nature of life to themselves because you know when somebody has in fact increased it that the guy's sitting there and you can just know damn well again nobody analyzes it but I know some of you will hear me that this guy is now sitting there and he's staring off in midair with his, you know, his hand on a <laughs> glass of water and he's just staring and you know internally he is plotting and considering jumping up and punching that waiter in the mouth when he comes back. You don't have any concern that he has drifted off and ceased commenting. He's coming more than normal. <laughs> so that's one thing. And people know the difference. That now back to my original scene of a man who you've taken out who's been bereaved over the death of his mother. And he does, he would physically from afar look the same in midair. He's constantly stopping his movement. And you are concerned, but in a different way. There's no doubt you don't mistake one for the other. No one does, no ordinary person. But what the concern is, what ordinary people know it is, that his internal commentary has slackened <laughs> to a highly unusual degree, which doesn't take much. Either way, my, first, my last example of the first one, that if somebody internally has now increased their commentary, and if they do, it's normally on the basis of some kind of aggression, anger, it doesn't take much to say it's increased enough that somebody would know it. The chatter is, is so constant that all you got to do is increase it a little or decrease it a little. And for those that can, be, well, people are aware of it without knowing it. But you are, you can feel it. You can be aware of it. And once you have some knowledge and you hear me describe it and you have occasion to look, I mean, it's just obvious. But it doesn't take much. So what I was saying, back to at least one point where we were, Ordinary people have occasion, two main occasions, or two easy ways to describe it, is that they throughout life momentarily have uh, very fleeting occurrences where the mind almost stops. And as I said, if you talk to them about the mind always chattering and commenting, and a person really listens, they can have an experience right then. It wouldn't do to tell them beforehand. Wouldn't have come, but as I was doing it, most of you realized when I said, if you mentioned a guy, if you said, did you realize that your mind is commenting and running constantly? And they go, constantly? And I go, without exception, never stops. And they go, and right then, it, it will stop. And I hate to say, momentarily, let's let it go with that. Momentarily, it will stop enough for them to rationally, from their view, enough for them to properly go, well, you know, I guess it does run on a lot, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say all the time, like every second. And I go, every damn second. And they go, and it will momentarily stop. <laughs> and they were proper to say, well, no, I, I can't go along with every second. That's the one occasion that it, it happens to people. It does happen. But it's so fleeting. Of course, the main thing is ordinary people, they would not learn from this anyway. They're not wired up for it. It's not proper. But I'm just pointing out that the experience is not supernatural. But at any rate, it is either they have it in life. Everyone does. Moments that, but they're so fleeting that no one takes any notice of it. The other one is, if it does happen over, if it does happen for a time less than fleeting, such as I was saying, that kind of emotional shock, it is then not viewed by anybody. The person involved doesn't really see it. But if he did, if it's pointed out, he'd probably agree that when it does run into extended periods, something other than momentary and fleeting, it is not by any of the participants, by anyone involved, seen as beneficial. In no wise. And it's not supposed to. No one says to a, someone bereaved to the point that they are sitting around just staring. No one says, well, I bet that's good for you by God. <laughs> you know they don't. They won't say, come on, damn it, and they'll slap them on the back and take them out. You know, you've got to snap out of this. But, if we get away from the ordinary, those who were born to run, those who realize, those who were born to fly. The feeling, the experience is incomparable. 
And you realize then, or much of what you've heard from me or that you've thought about or you've read or imagined all your life suddenly, I'm talking about suddenly, non-verbally makes all the sense that it never did. But think about it. It makes sense now that you internally have become quiet. This is the experience where the way I'm discussing, describing it to not recall. It's this suddenly of stepping back internally from the screen, an ex experiential separation between you and life, non-physically, between you and life, and a cessation of the internal comment about life. Until it happens, you don't know how extraordinary it is, and until it happens, for me to say, well, when it does happen, it will answer all the kinds of loose ends and questions you, that, never, that you had or thought that didn't make sense. It will answer them, but don't, that's just a comma. But understand the curious part is, I'm saying when then, when you're in a state wherein you have no comment. I'll try it again, perhaps. Literally appearing conundrums or non sequiturs do not have the same impact on you people that it had at one time, which is not, which is not the point of this. But you understand, what I'm saying is suddenly many, many, many of the things that you never quite understood that physically or that verbally, that literally, that rationally, that intellectually never quite fit, that they suddenly make all the sense in the world that now you understand it, except it's in a state when you're not talking. <laughs> it's not that when you step back and get away from it and you go, ah, now I see. Because I never understood when, no. Nah. <laughs> it's now I see, but <laughs> it's finally that the mind, it's finally that the mind understands that the mind is actually functioning the way that the guy last time we met, you remember I told you about a man? Who in his general attempt at self-improvement and specifically to try and reinforce the responsibilities of his internal organs called him all together and said, all right, I'm going to give you a name and describe what you should do. And he said, your name to the stomach, he said, is stomach. And your job is digestion. And to the lungs, he said, your name is lungs and you're in charge of breathing. And he got, covered everybody. All of it, finally, only the brain left, the mind. He got the mind. He said, all right, I'm going to call you the mind. And since there's only one activity left, I mean, everybody else got a job. And there's only, the way it worked out, there's only one organ. That was the last one he picked. And he'd already given out all the responsibilities, all the jobs except one. And he said, so you see what yours is. But he eventually, in spite of the fact that he was just sure that his instructions, his descriptions of the job were clear, comprehensive, in spite of all that, he never was fully satisfied with the mind's performance, <laughs> with its compliance thereto. That is it. For the first time in your life, you know what I'm saying, that the mind is operating the way everybody else talks about that it should be, the way that theoretically the whole world has always said, well, here's the way the intellect works. And if you say, well, does it do so with you? They go, well, yeah. <laughs> You're done for. There's nothing else to say. It's like holding a mirror in front of a mirror and say, what do you see? And it goes, what? For the first time, the mind, or if you like it this way, even the language, which is the tool of the mind, for the first time in your life, you understand, well, that's it. This is, what I, this is what's been missing. For the first time, you son of a gun, you're operating correctly. <laughs> but for the first time, from one view, what's happened is, it's shut up. That was the kind of mystical humor. <laughs> the very limited humor for the few.